Good. So let's go for the for, for the next part, and we have kind of limited amount of time to cover the next part. So let's move forward and discuss about other pieces. Okay. Now we are going to the uh, fourth part of the session today on the speech perception, and kind of I'm going to give you kind of a, a sense that how this is going to be very complex because when we kind of spell when we have the sound of D in D, D, DA. In all of them, D is the same. We feel that we have the same D in D, D, DA. But in reality, the sound that we have in for it, specifically, not for the entire D, it's just for D, for the constant of D here. The D part is different from D to D to DA. You have different Ds here in, in, in sound. And this is something that you can see in terms of the, even the range of frequencies that you have for D, D, DA. And the question is, okay, if it is that complex, so we cannot basically decompose sounds to, because the question is, okay, we discussed that the first level of decomposition was frequency. Okay, we decomposed the, the information to frequency. What would be the, the simple unit of analysis for human speech? Should we go for every single consonants and vowels? Should we go for every single phonemes that we have? Should we go for kind of every single syllabus that we have? Or should we go for words? Should we go for sentences? What are the minimum or the temporal resolution or the single piece of information that we start to, to process? If we go back to, to, to visual processing, you can remember that we have been talking about, okay, the directions and lines and dots and as we ask in this kind of the, the exam today, we discuss about, okay, when we are talking about something like the thalamus, in the thalamus we have the processing in terms of the dots, and then when we go to other levels we have lines and then colors. So in the visual system we have a better understanding about the units of analysis in different levels. But in the auditory system it is still under debate in terms of what are the the minimum levels, or what are the units of analysis in the auditory processing. We know that with kind of brain imaging methods, we can explore uh, potentials and understanding of, about these, these processes, and we discussed about that before in terms of, okay, we can have activations in different parts of the brain. Uh, this is a classic kind of uh, speech understanding or task that you are listening to something obviously you can see that you have activations in the the transverse temporal cortex here we have activation in the transverse kind of temporal cortex we have activations in we have discussed in thalamus in inferior colliculus and you know that it is this one is which section we are using here yes we are using coronal section and then we need to report what? Y, Z, or X here. Which one should we re report here? Let's say reporting that Y is, or Z, or X is something like N, and this one is Y, N plus something. So is this Y, Z, or X when we are reporting Corona? You can report that in the chat space. Yes, it is true. Why? This is why. Because we are moving from back to front. So we are changing the Y axis. And we have exactly the same X, Y, and X. If I go to that paper that we have been discussing about, these are X, Y, and so these are the coordinates. And as you have done your homeworks, you know that you need to ask whether these coordinates are MNI coordinates or Talera coordinates. So we need to know these coordinates. So these are the the peak of these activations. This is the coordinates of the peaks of these activations that we have been seeing in this paper that we have been discussing about the previous part of the session together. Okay, so let's go back to this figure. And then if we just give people what we call uh, 
sublexial information. So piece of information that do not make words. We have activations in the primary auditory cortex. But if you give them lexical information, the information that the activations would go beyond just the simple the primary sensory cortex, sensory auditory sensory cortex, and they go to the areas that are multimodal. And I told you this is the Broadman area 22, or the area that we call Wernicke cortex. So they go a little bit down and to the, to the back to be able to process the words that we have inside the human speech. If we just give people uh, different sort of uh, kind of auditory tasks and the speech production tasks, and I've done that before in terms of because we have been doing uh, surgical planning for for patients, and we develop different sort of kind of auditory tasks, and there are different tasks in terms of we can just give people different words to to, to kind of read. You can just ask them to listen to words. You can ask them to read and reproduce. You can just give them some uh, alphabets to make to produce words. You can give them the alphabets in the wrong order, or the, the reverse order, and then asking them to... Rep so there are different versions of tasks. And when you have these different versions, there are different activations in different parts of the brain. These figures that we have, are what is the kind of the type of sections that we are showing here? Coronal, sagittal, or transverse? You can put it into the chat space. Yes, exactly. We are showing sagittal. And sagittal cuts are the worst type of cuts <laughs> to understand because we usually do not use the sagittal cuts. The reason that they have tried to use sagittal cut here is that they have tried to show these basically three activations in the single cut. And this one is left, and this one is right. And this one is motor. So this one is, as you can see here, they are related to motor activations. This one here, this is the sylvian sulcus. This is a superior temporal sulcus. This one is in superior temporal gyrus. This one is an, an area that we call temporoparietal. So this one is the uh, the area between in the sylvian gyrus in the sylvian sulcus in the temporal parietal area, and you can see that this kind of primary or auditory processing is bilateral, but the language part and the language understanding part is unilateral. It is on the on the left side. We do not have these activations here. There is no activation for the right side. So. It gives you a sense about how these things are different. And then we can have, if we give people these tasks, and this is exactly the area that I was discussing about, this area that we kind of showed before in this area, which is about kind of understanding and perception and, and production and everything, which is close to what we call Wernicke area. And if I give people different tasks, for example, if I ask them to just listen and then rest, this is the activation. If I give them listen and not rest, that is the activation. If I give them listen and repeat, that is going to be activation. So we can modulate the activation of this, this Wernicke area, area that we discuss about, with different sort of tasks that people are using. And then based on these multiple fMRI studies, people start to develop these models. And the reality is that no single study, no single human brain mapping study would be able to make these maps. These maps are basically constructed by scientists based on the different pieces of information and they just make a model trying to explain different studies that people have done. Obviously, as you can see here, this one is right or left. This side, the B1, is right or left? And A is right or left? Yes, this one is right and this one is left. And you know that in the left we have inferior frontal gyrus, areas in the promotor area. Then we have superior temporal gyrus. We have superior temporal sulcus. This yellow one is superior temporal sulcus. We have front temporal 
polar area or anterior temporal lobe. We have middle temporal. So there are lots of, and this one is sylvian parietal. So this area that we discussed about, which I told you, which is close to the area of Wernicke that we discussed about. And SMG, what was SMG? What was SMG? Anybody remember? What was SMG? Yep, good. Yes, it was supramarginal gyrus. So that is good. That is good that, I mean, we are learning them one by one. And what was the area behind the, the supramarginal gyrus? It was, it was not lingual gyrus. Lingual gyrus was in the medial <laughs> occipital cortex. <laughs> okay, good. And the reason that we call it angular gyrus is because it has a shape like this. Something like an angle. That's what we, call, we call it angular gyrus. And the lingual gyrus is something like a, a tongue. That is what we call it lingual gyrus. Okay, that is fine. So, and there are some pathways between these areas. We discussed about some of these kind of white matter track pathways before. So if you just use this figure and combine that what you were discussed about uh, kind of uh, DTI, you can kind of see how they are uh, mapped to each other in terms of having what we call oncinate fasciculus here. We discussed about <clears throat> arcuate fasciculus. We discussed about fronto-occipital fasciculus. So these white matter tracts are actually connecting these areas together. So it is not just functional connectivity, but we also have white matter tracts that are connecting these areas together. Perfect. The other thing I'm going to kind of show you, just going back to the kind of the experiments that I have been showing you before, uh, this is the last part of this section. If you remember, we have discussed about exposing people to drug-related cues, neutral cues, and having the contrast here, drug versus neutral. And obviously, when we put people inside the scanner and show them kind of visual pictures, do you expect to have any activation in the temporal cortex? Do you expect to have any activation in Heschel gyrus? And can I find the Heschel gyrus here? Do you agree that this one is Heschel gyrus? Right? This is Heschel gyrus. Do you have any activation in Heschel gyrus here? Do we? So we do not have any. As you see, we do not have any activation here because I mean, there is no auditory processing here happening, okay? And if I just even show you the brain atom atlas, in brain atom atlas, if we go for temporal gyrus, superior temporal gyrus, these are the, the primary auditory cortex is happening here. We do not have any signal here. I mean, nothing is here. So this is not an area that you have activation in our task, in, in visual drug curie activity task. There is no activation here. We have lots of activation in uh, kind of inferior temporal gyrus, fusiform gyrus, parahippocampal gyrus. Why? Because we have objects. And we have more important objects in the drug-related pictures compared to neutral pictures. That's the reason we have activation, but nothing here in, in superior temporal gyrus. But it might be also interesting for you that we because we showed these kind of blocks of pictures four times, what was interesting for me is we can see that there are areas like ventromedial prefrontal cortex here that they have a habituation of response. So we have a reduction in response. This is the drug response. This is the neutral response. So the figure that I was showing you before was the average response of all those four blocks subtracted from each other. This is the one single average response contrast between those, those images. But this one, is, we are kind of making the separate response from neutral drugs and distribute them over the time in four times of exposure because we expose them four times. But it's interesting that areas like ventromedial prefrontal cortex, we have reduction in response in areas that are processing reward. This is a reward processing area. We have a reduction in response because when you see the picture in the first step, they are rewarding. The second is not that much rewarding. The third, I mean, it's never the same second time around. So it is not as rewarding in the next times. 
And I mean, there is a significant activation here in the VMPFC. But when we talk about, we had an interesting cluster in superior templar gyrus, which is around the Heschel. Do you see that, the Heschel gyrus here? And do you see the, the planum temporal behind? This is the planum temporal. So you have, we have planum temporal, Heschel gyrus, in different Z. So the Z are different. So I mean, these are the details that you, you need to start to, to learn. There is no activation. The signal is around zero. So there is no significant difference. But there is an interaction effect. And the question is, why do we have an interaction effect here? For those who are in, in the field of substance use disorder, why do we have an interaction in superior temporal gyrus in a totally visual task? In a totally visual task. That is something that we can discuss about later. OK, this is the end of this section. So we discuss about the, the pathways and how these are working together and the complexities that we have in this level. <music>